Zeppelin's first European tour took them to a Danish TV studio, where they encountered a woman who nearly stopped their ascent dead in its tracks. And it was Baroness von Zeppelin. And uh, well, she was so overjoyed that we'd use the family name and, uh, and all the rest of it, you know, pleasantries. And they, showed, they, they took her out into the studio to show her around, you see, and uh, suddenly she saw the, the album cover. First album cover, this is of the Zeppelin crashing in place. There's this almighty shrieking and she came back in and uh, threatening to have the lawyers stop the show. And all of this was going on right to the point of transmission. So, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it reflects in that show, I can tell you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was fun, all part of the thing, yeah. the labour of love. <laughs> We start. We employed the numbers into the stage act. But that's that wasn't the end of the story. So it was just the beginning. We'd start. We'd make those numbers work for us. You know, we're content to just play them note for note, perfect as many people are these days, for instance, and even were then. By the time we got to Led Zeppelin III, there was something obviously very, very um, crucial about what we were doing because we'd already developed so many different strands of music within a four-man structure. I guess that's one of the key factors of why Zeppelin was able to go into all these different you know, um, you know, new ground, or, or touch new ground within music, uh, uh, because we didn't have to bother about uh, sticking to a format. Oh, I love you more. Yes, I love you, baby. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Oh, yeah. The last thing that we relied on was formula. And, and knowing that we were doing fine. When Led Zeppelin III followed the album with a whole lot of love and heartbreaker and stuff on it, everybody went, well, why kill a perfectly good career? And you make moves, you, you have mus musical turns and twists to satisfy yourself. That's what has to come first. And the record company would have liked, liked us to have done something which sounded exactly the same as a whole lot of love with different lyrics, I'm sure. But that's not where we were at. We would, it, whenever we got together to uh, to record an album, it was always uh, a summing up of where we were at that point of time. But I tried, I tried, I tried, I Zeppelin's fourth album surprised even the band by spawning one of the biggest radio hits of all time, Stairway to Heaven. There's a lady who's sure All that glitters is gold And she's buying the stairway to heaven You can't say that Stairway to Heaven was a clear-cut way of getting good radio to success because it was nine, ten minutes long. And uh, it didn't happen. Of course, it didn't have anything. We used to play at concerts and people just used to slow hand clap the thing because they didn't know what it was. I've worked on it for quite, quite a while, um, on and off. To, I was putting all these different sections together and putting them in what I considered was the right order before I even presented it to the band. People used to say about Stairway to Heaven, what was it like when you first wrote it, you know? You know you, you, as if there were sort of you know, three wise men knocking on the door. Excuse me, are you writing Stairway to Heaven here? Double Neck came after the, uh, after the release of the album, actually. So we could do it on stage. I couldn't do it on a 12 string or a 6 string. It's curious because a lot of people think that I actually, you know, we actually recorded it on the Double Neck. So we could set that one straight. Zeppelin's 
Zeppelin cemented its position as the top hard rock band of the decade with Houses of the Holy in 1973. two years later with Physical Graffiti, an album that showcased Page's hypnotic riff mastery on the classic track, Kashmir. Uh, I think riffs really come from the blues, but uh, I certainly, I certainly spent a lot of time working on riffs and it might have created a lot of new insights into riffs that haven't been enjoyed before. Zeppelin had so much variety that it would be great if some of these, if classic rock is the bane of, of progressive music or whatever it is, it would be nice if they went to things like physical graffiti and played it in um, the Rover or Custard Pie or something like that, you know, because it, it's, it's, the, it's the variety that keeps Zepp alive. <laughs> Physical graffiti was probably the greatest moment musically, or greatest set of moments. Uh, because, because it was done with a mobile 16-track studio in an old house, and we were stuck in there, and we wrote things on the spot. I trampled under foot, stairway to heaven, was written at Headley Grange, actually, for the fourth album, so I'm lying. Uh, Cashmere, In the Light, stuff like that, which was really very, very good. Zeppelin's distinctive blend of hard rock power and compositional complexity was memorably demonstrated on the group's 1976 album Presence, with a track called Achilles' Last Stand. That one was my brainchild, really, as far as. Uh... You know, all these sort of guitar parts and, <clears throat> and all the, you know, the ascending guitar figures and... Uh, I remember John Paul Jones wasn't really sure whether, it, you know, when I said, no, I've got a scale that goes over these, because you, you can't, you, there isn't a scale, I said, believe me, believe me, I've got one. <laughs> In 1979's In Through the Outdoor was the last album Led Zeppelin would release as a group, and as a thumb of the nose to critics who considered the band an overinflated hype, they put it out in a paper bag. It still follows on from the, uh, from the early days of getting hammered by the press and saying, all right, we'll put it out in a pound paper bag then. It sold unfashionably 10 million copies as well. It's funny, really funny how people used to knock it and then go, oh, <coughs> sorry, you look through their records, oh no, that's not really there. <laughs> That's just a brown paper bag. 